Again, my name's Reverend Tamara, and thank you all for being here today. And we've been especially thanked for patience on Zoom and in the room. There's been some movement around. We've been having our usual lovely joys of tech challenges. But you know, look at I think we're handling it pretty well. Calm, we're calm, 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 which is good. Yes, thanks to all the volunteers who are doing everything. Yes, the volunteers are fabulous. So today my talk is about pain pushes until our vision pulls. And so when I started looking into this talk this week, I of course went to the first place I went to is it's keep going okay <laughs> see these things i get distracted i'm like squirrel <laughs> i don't know if anybody else gets like that sorry you guys but pain pushes until vision pulls i don't know what i just said last so we'll just start over we're going to reset and it's knowing that pain acts as a pushing force that compels us to address discomfort and challenges while the vision of the desired outcome serves as pulling force that inspires us to move forward and make positive changes in our life. So pain, when we think of pain, there's the different styles of pain. There's that physical pain we get. And thank goodness sometimes we have that physical pain. Because imagine you put your hand on that stove and you don't feel it. And next thing you know, you've burnt your hand. You've done, you know, some damage to your fingertips. <laughs> We've probably all been there and done that. But that pain gets us to, to stop and move forward and move through it. So that was where I was going earlier. Now I remember what I was talking about. <laughs> I, when I was looking up this talk, I was on YouTube and trying to find different things. And this, uh, Michael Beckwith, I think, is really credited for this pain uh, pushes till vision pulls. And so, you know, you go down this, I go down this rabbit hole sometimes of looking up ideas. And then I found, so talking about the stove and the hot, there are actual people that have a receptor that blocks pain. So if they touch that hot stove, they don't know it. So in the New Yorker, there was this whole article about this lady who couldn't feel the pain and the different strategies that she had to put in place so that she didn't, she was very fortunate that she'd never been hurt extremely um, badly. So it's nice to know that pain can be good and that sometimes if we don't feel it, that we need to have those strategies to put us into place. And those strategies, I think, are in our spiritual and our emotional pain is the, the spiritual practices that we do. So today, Jill led an earlier meditation. And, um, right, because when, when I first got up here today, which I still feel like I need to do more of, is that breathing, that breath, taking that moment of just centering in. And when I can ground myself, like and feel grounded in my seat or in my body, that is when I can start dealing through and moving through the change of what is going on in my life. So Rumi says, don't run away from grief, O soul. Look for the remedy inside the pain because the rose came from the thorn and the ruby came from the stone. The thorn, the rose came from the thorn and the ruby came from the stone. And it's, you know, the diamond too, right? It gets pressure and that's how it is formed. So the pain that we get and that we move through is really that divine discomfort. So when we have that divine discomfort that makes us move, that makes us, challenges us, that allows us to move outside of that comfort zone that we're in, because sometimes it's even being in the pain, we can stay inside that comfort zone. But then it gets to that point where it's like, okay, I, can't, I just can't do this anymore. I need to move because this is just too much. So what do we do when we get to those places? We talk to a practitioner. We tune into really developing that inner voice, that inner guidance, that wisdom, because there's always that endless possibility that is there. So it's a matter of tapping into that and taking the time. And whether it's 30 seconds of breathing or touching your fingers and really focusing. Like if you just, right now, just touch your fingers 
together. And just see, can you feel the ridges? Can you feel that sensation? But that just brings you present. It gets you out of thinking about the past, gets you out of thinking of the future. It gets you to right here, right now. And that's where the joy is. Is when we, you know, it, it gets us out of that place of looking and wishing and hoping that thing, my past was better. It gets me here right now. Because I know that I can make a new choice now to move and make a better future. And uh, who knows what that future is going to be, but I know that I can change at any time. And when we stay into that, it, 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 you just move it past that worrying. I don't know about any of you, but I can be a bit of a worry wart. You know, my son who just moved back in, yay. <laughs> <laughs> you know, goes back out and he's being a 25-year-old young man, he's not a boy anymore, or I have to let him do his life. But there's, there's those challenges as a, a, a mom or a parent or a guardian, even I'm sure an aunt and uncle, that you, you want to keep them safe. And yet they have to go out and experience the pain of what, sometimes the pain, sometimes the joy of what's going on in life. We've got to let them experience that. Because sometimes I've noticed in bringing up children that if, we co if I coddle my children too much, then they, they don't get to know what it's like to live life fully. They don't get to get out and explore into the woods or into relationships. They try and keep themselves safe because, oh, that's what mom taught me. I've got to stay safe. And life isn't always about the safety. Right? Sometimes we need that risk. We need to shift into something a little uncomfortable, that divine discomfort. But we want to move away from the discomfort that is maybe from racism, um, from all the, if you think of the negative parts of discomfort, right? Those are things that we want to heal. Those things can be healed and shifted, but the divine discomfort is good. And I don't know how often I think, oh my gosh, I'm in pain, this is awful, I don't want to deal with this, I just want to run away and hide. But yet, if I listen, in and know that truth of who I am, that I am this spirit having a human experience, I can express differently. I can shift differently. There's a, I love there's a little story about a man who had a, a donkey. And the donkey was out wandering his fields and there was a well and the donkey fell into the well. So the donkey was, Whoa. I don't know how donkeys bray, but they do something, I won't try. <laughs> and so he fell into that well, and he was braying, and he was clawing, trying to get out, but he couldn't get out. And then the, the farmer came along, and this was his favorite donkey, so he's got ropes, he got all sorts of things, and he tried to pull him out, and he couldn't. He was just by himself, there was nobody around to help. So he just thought... I, for all you animal lovers, I'm sorry, but he just thought, I have to put this donkey out of its misery. So the only thing he could do at that time is start to fill in the hole to bury the donkey. I know, it's very sad. There's a happy ending. <laughs> so luckily this donkey, right? So the guy would shovel and he'd put some dirt and the donkey would shake his head and shake his body and it would fall down. And he kept doing that, so the dirt kept piling up under the donkey, and then the donkey would climb up on the dirt. So then the, the man, the farmer, realized what was going on. He realized what the donkey was doing, because the donkey had stopped braying and stopped panicking. He had started to move. The donkey realized that he was helping himself by doing the movements that he was doing. So at the end, the more soil's poured in, he shakes it off and then steps back up, and the higher it rows, and it says here, by noon, the donkey was grazing on green pastures. All right, that was the shift. The donkey was in pain, he was afraid, he didn't know what to do, but he called out for help, our practitioner's help, and then the, they, the help came, and though it might not seem that the help was there, 
at the time, right? He was thinking that he was doing helping in another way, but it turned out totally different than what either I think the donkey or the farmer imagined. And that's the part, it's about overcoming pain as that catalyst to growth. When we explore our pain as it serves as that driving force sometimes to propel us to seek personal development, make, it of, make positive changes, or find new paths in life. And when we can move into that next vision, that next play into moving into vision, moving into what is it that we really want in life? You know, I had my, one of my mentors ask me this week, Tamara, if you could have your perfect day in ministry, what would it look like? What would it look like? And I was like, oh. And I said, well, you know, I got to get the newsletter out. I got to do some social media. I got to make sure the tech stuff works. I got to do this. And he goes, is that your perfect day? And I went, oh, maybe not. Maybe not. My perfect day is spending time building that relationship with that divine. And they told me they used to never take a call before noon unless somebody was dying and they needed them right away. That was emergencies are allowed. But taking that time, and I know a lot of us don't have that three hours to spend every day developing that relationship, but do you have two minutes a day? Do you have two minutes a day that you can stop and breathe? Maybe touch your fingers. Maybe you can tense your body up and let it go. There's all sorts of different strategies that we can use to get in touch with that deeper place within us. I think it, Chief Dan George said, may the stars carry your sadness away. May the flowers fill your heart with beauty. May hope forever wipe away your tears. And above all, may silence make you strong. May silence make you strong. And that's that piece of listening to ourselves, getting quiet sometimes in that silence. And another piece I think that's really important is forgiveness. We've talked a lot about forgiveness in different ways, but this forgiveness is forgiveness of self. When we keep ourselves stuck because I'm not forgiving myself for being the way I was or the things I did, or then I, I, you know, I want to look at somebody else and, and blame them, and not letting them go. Because they don't know I'm sitting there in my muck, stuck. They're just living their lives, going about life, doing the thing, right? So it, it's really about that inner personal work again. And I think for me, this was really, Sorry, I'm just getting emotional thinking about this story. I was thinking I was going to share. Somebody challenged me to be a little more vulnerable, and I'm like, ah. But it's that piece of growing up. My mom has married a few times. So my biological father and my mom split up. Very turbulent circumstances when I was two. So I lived a life of not knowing my biological father. And I know that's a story that's quite common. But that little girl then turns into... I was abandoned, I was hurt, he doesn't love me. Then there was extra family dynamics where he had his new wife and she didn't want him to see me. I had my new stepfather, he didn't want him to see me. So then you have all these pieces fighting against it. And as a little girl, you still don't, you don't understand all those dynamics. You don't understand that him not seeing you isn't because he doesn't want to see you or that he doesn't love you. I didn't know that then. And it took me till 2020 when he, yeah, so, okay, math. Anyways, I was older, <laughs> in my 50s. And <clears throat> I was away at conference, which is actually conferences happening right now again this year and at rcsl.org, and I was in Denver, and I got the call and said, if you want to see your dad for the last time, you need to 
come and see that. And meanwhile, we hadn't done the work. I've been doing my own work, but we hadn't done the work together. But at the end of the day, when I went to see him, I was able to get back before he passed away, luckily. And I was able to sit there and hold his hand and say, I forgive you. I forgive myself for having all these judgments about you. I forgive you for maybe not being how you wanted to be and not being how I wanted you to be. That's the key. Those expectations that I put on him held me back. It held me back in some of my other relationships with my husband, my son, my brother. I realized that the, that whole way of looking at that relationship with that one person in my life affected so many other relationships. So what did I, I did some very serious <laughs> forgiveness work through, especially in practitioner training. Oh my goodness, there was one time when Reverend Terry, I was just really into this, getting it done, and I was pretty much a ball on the floor. <laughs> and, and my practitioner sisters and everybody held me and just let me cry because I don't think up until that moment, because I was a tough little girl, I was getting through things. That was the story I had made up about myself. Nobody's going to get me down. I'm just going to do it. And, but that also affected, again, the relationships, not letting people in close, not letting people take care of me. My husband is such a caregiver. It is, I don't know how I attracted, well, I know, well, I shouldn't say that. I don't know how I attracted that, but I did. And I'm so fortunate that he just loves to do that. But it's taken me a long time to now be in that place of, thank you, thank you. Like, he didn't come today, but he comes sometimes, and I call him my roadie. <laughs> or he'll take and he'll play pickleball with me, even though he's much better than I am, but he won't complain. <laughs> so, but there's those things that we do in life to, to, love, to love our others. So forgiveness. Forgiveness is one of that ways that we can for move through the pain and the, into that vision of what I wanted. Because what I wanted is great relationships with the men in my life. My intention is to have great relation, relationships with my brother, with my stepdad, with my husband, with my son. And I realized it's not chasing after those relationships. It's not chasing after them. But it's being who I am, my authentic self, and allowing that to be. And knowing <clears throat> that who I am is enough. Who I am is enough. I don't need to change. I don't need to fit into that little box so that they will love me. Because I have it here now. Or I didn't have that before. And it's not every day I have it. <laughs> Some days... I can take out that two by four and give myself a good little, oh, Tamara. But the thing is, most days now, I can get through it. I can stop, I can breathe, I can meditate, I can pray, I can call a practitioner, I can do the different things that I need to do to move through the pain, to move through the sorrow, and move into how I want to be. So... <clears throat> How do we tie this all together? There's an anonymous quote that said, by leaving your comfort zone behind and taking a leap into faith, a leap of faith into something new, you find out who you are truly capable of becoming. By taking that leap of faith into something new, you find out who you are truly capable of coming, becoming. And isn't that true? There's so many times that, is anybody here like started a new job or gone on a new direction? And all of a sudden they're like, oh, this is, actually this is better than what I originally wanted, right? But they're learning that something new. Once you get through that learning curve, you can lean into it, lean into the faith. So there's so many valuable lessons into interplay between pain and vision highlighting the significant role of personal growth, resilience, and well-being. Pain acts as a powerful motivator that pushes individuals to address discomfort, 
seek solution and make the necessary change. So when I think of this, I think of that discomfort, that pain when we move through it. <clears throat> and I think of uh, Emma, Jill brought it up in class the other day and I thought that's such a great thing. She said uh, a quote by Emma Curtis Hopkins. So when something was happening in Emma Curtis Hopkins' life, who is trained with Ernest Holmes, or he trained with her, sorry, and she said, this too is good. This too is God. This too is for me. And the best part is she says, I demand to see the blessing. I demand to see the blessing. Because there's, whether we might think it is or not, there's always a gift somewhere along the road. And sometimes we might not even see it in our lifetime. It might affect a generation after us. It might affect, you know, a different thing. I think of my switching my relationship with my, <clears throat> with the men in my life, that I'm watching my daughter now attract a wonderful loving relationship and not having, not repeating those same issues that I've had, which is just lovely and allowing, yeah, it's so good, right? And she allows him to take care of her. And I, I sometimes go like this, <laughs> but you know, but that is their relationship and that is how they like to be. And he's happy doing it and she's happy receiving it. So this too is good. This too is God. This too is for me and I demand to see the blessing. So <clears throat> there's also a Chinese uh, proverb that I really like here. They s recommended, it says, you cannot prevent the birds of sorrow from flying over your head, but you can pre prevent them from building a nest in your hair. <laughs> right? Right? So it's moving from that pain, knowing that, <clears throat> yes, we've had these challenging situations in our life. And, you know, I don't want to spiritual bypass anything. Things do hurt. Things happen in our lives that are not what we'll term as good. I don't like to go into duality, but there's these things that happen in the world. There's the wars. There is so many people getting hurt, children getting cancer. These things that are painful to witness and hear about. But it's not saying to somebody that, oh, where is your consciousness? And sometimes in this teaching, we can do that. We can say, oh, well, you're not what right with the one if you're feeling pain or if you're feeling this. Mm -mm. That's not true. You are always whole, perfect, and complete no matter what you are experiencing at any time. At any time. And I know that sometimes for some people that can be hard to hear that you're whole, perfect, and complete. But it is... I'd like to use the F word, but I'm not. Yeah. True. <laughs> right? It is true. And it's remembering that for ourselves. And if we can't remember it for ourselves, this is why we have community. This is why we have come on Sundays. This is why we take classes. This is why we have a practitioner. This is why we have that friend that you know that you can just call at any time of day or night and they will know that truth for you. And not maybe buy into the story that you're telling yourselves and remind you, mm-mm-mm, -mm -mm, you are whole, perfect, and complete, just how you are. So I think for homework this week, because you know, I have a question for you. So what are some techniques that you can use to reframe challenges and opportunities for growth? I like to call them afflows, another F, learning opportunity. <laughs> Using it twice today. <laughs> Don't look at me like that, Jill, I'm sorry. <laughs> but it's good. It's, it's reframing those opportunities for growth and expansion and what role that that can play in supporting us in reaching that goal that we want. Now, I'm not necessarily one big on goals. I like prefer setting intentions, or if I have a way of a thing that is challenging me in my life and I'm using prayer, 
then I like to go to the mental equivalent. So that is knowing what it is that you want. It's very similar to an intention with that. So ask yourself this week, what things can you reframe in your life and look at a different way? So to end, I'm going to read a little bit from the practical, this is an oldie, but a goodie, a practical application of science of mind. And I just happened to pick it up and it fell open to this page, not on purpose. It just opened. It said, pain as a friend and a teacher. Physical pain is not necessarily an enemy since it calls attention to serious conditions which need to be changed, thus enabling one to take the proper steps in rearranging our life. Therefore, we should not be bitter over it or become melancholy through having experienced it. On the other hand, we must be equally certain that we do not fall under the mistaken idea that illness is opposed upon us by some power as though God were tantalizing us <laughs> oh goodness, or clubbing us into acquiescence to the divine will. All experiences should tend to enlarge our awareness of the real purpose of life and help us arrive at a greater realization of the spirit that is within us. That spirit that was within us is always there. And we just have to remember it. So with that, let's take this into prayer. knowing that there is one life, one love, one universal divine mind that is operating right here, right now, in, through, and as each person. I know today that this oneness of all things, the oneness of God, the oneness of life, the oneness of love, that oneness of endless possibility is expressing through every person who is here in the room on Zoom listening to this, knowing that life is good. Life is for me. Life is the divine essence. And I demand to see the gift. So today, as I go through my day, knowing this truth of who I am and knowing it for each person, I know that life is unfolding in that perfect way for my highest and best. So today, I let these words go with gratitude, with joy and love, knowing that I can move through life in this way of being that is authentic, joyful, loving, kind. Because that is the essence of each person. So as I know it for myself, I know it for each of you. So I let these words go, I let it be, and ask you to join me in saying, and so it is.